This is Sebi Medina Tayak live from Eaton, D.C. on K Street, a.k.a. the Belly of the Beast, a.k.a. Babylon. Um, we're here in the radio station with um, some very special guests, and I'll let them introduce themselves. But um, we have... Uh, we have folks from Guster, from Reverb, from Comunidad Soweto, from Maroon 5, from Dave Matthews Band. So we have some, uh, we have some star power in the studio today. So um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit. And then we'll start talking about what they're doing here. All right. I guess I'll start. Yeah, we'll go down hey, this is Adam. I play in the band Guster. And uh, I'm co-founder and co-director of the nonprofit group Reverb. And... Uh, Basically, in a nutshell, Reverb was started by my wife and I to engage the music community, use the power uh, and reach of music and the connection, the special connections musicians have with their fans to engage them in environmental causes that, that run the gamut. Um, so what we're talking about today is, is one that's really near and dear to our hearts because our musical instruments are playing a role in this uh, Unfortunately, so then, you know, with the wood that's being used, and the, so this, this is what we're about to talk about is is a part of a larger partnership and campaign that Reverb and EIA are doing together called No More Bloodwood, um, and this particular um, piece of it is we're calling defending the defenders, um, and it's a, it's really how it impacts indigenous communities. And I'll just move the mic on down the line because I can keep talking, but we'll, we have time for that later. <laughs> Hi, uh, I am Julia Urunaga. I'm, uh, I work for the Environmental Investigation Agency for EIA. We're doing this together with Reverb. Um, I work in Peru, um, and we um, are allies in supporting the fight that indigenous uh, leaders are leading against illegal logging because of all these destructive impacts that it has on their communities, on their way of lives, and on their people directly. And um, here is Diana. Buenos días con todo. Gracias por darme ese espacio. De verdad, estoy muy agradecida a cada uno de y en, y en primer lugar a los que están aquí, los amigos que ya conozco y de verdad que se fueron a Perú y conocieron la realidad. Y, y mi nombre es Diana Río Renquijo de la comunidad ashénica de pueblos indígenas. Y mi liderazgo como mujer y como madre, luchadora, emprendedora, y queremos ser, como dice, escuchado nuestras voz. Y muchas gracias. Um, so this is Diana, um, Diana Rios. She is from the indigenous community of Alto Tamaya Sahueto, comunidad, uh, community Ashenica. Um, she's very happy to be here. She's very thankful for the interest on this on these very important matters for um, for her community and the indigenous communities in Peru. She's very happy to see friends because these musicians came to uh, Peru and to her indigenous um, to to learn about the, her um, problems and the problems of the indigenous communities. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here. Thank you. My name is James Valentine, and I am one of those musicians that was engaged uh, by Adam here in Reverb, and uh, we were just really lucky to be included in this trip to Peru, uh, which was uh, just very fascinating, very troubling on a lot of different levels, but I guess we'll talk more about that. Hi, I'm Stefan Lassard. I play bass for Dave Matthews Band, and um, I'm also another one of those musicians who... Um, just recently realized that my wood and my instruments might not come from the best places and uh, might be causing problems um, <clears throat> to communities outside of my world and my bubble. So this trip to Peru was a, a great learning experience and hope that we uh, can continue the conversation after this is over. Oh well, yeah, I'm, I want to I want to start there actually because it's now come up a few times, right? When we're talking about, like you said, you called it bloodwood. Is that mm -hmm. what you called it? Yeah, bloodwood, and we hear blood diamonds, right? Where someone, the love of their life, you know, there's something that they're very attached to, their wedding ring, or um, in your case, you know, your your instrument, something that you're very emotionally attached to. You're maybe learning that it's coming from. Um, not a good place. So what's that? What's that process? Person? What's that personally like to realize something that you're so attached to something that is your instrument, you know, for self-expression comes from a place like this. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? Sure. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So, so 
Dave Matthews, Man of Maroon 5, and Reaver have been working together for over a decade, um, doing all sorts of things environmentally. So then when more recently we realized that this issue with uh, illegal logging and that and and laws here with the importation of woods that are questionably legal um, and how musical instruments can play a role in that because their rare tone was that are very valuable. It was a very easy um, kind of call to arms amongst my fellow musicians. It was like, holy crap, guys. Like We've been doing all this work to keep our tours green and to engage our fans in environmental causes, yet the very music that we're playing and the instruments that we're expressing ourselves through could be ripped out of a rainforest, a world heritage site, illegally by child and slave labor. Like we, we was, It was one of those shocking holy crap moments, you know? And so it was a very alarming and we had a very quick response from a number of musicians that I literally just kind of threw up the bat signal and sent out an email. I'd be like, oh my God, everybody, look, listen to this, Let's check this out. Um, so very quickly back in 2012 when it was being fought um, in, uh, on the hill over here um, in Congress, about, they were trying to gut the Lacey Act, which is a law that prevents the the importation of illegally sourced wood and makes sure that you know proper sourcing happens was being uh under was actually being called under threat so the initial um round of artist involvement was were artists signing on to this letter that i submitted to congress debate when i testified to congress saying hey look at all these musicians this is what the music community thinks about the lacy act and keeping illegal logging out of musical instruments and yeah the it, it it just guarantees, I mean, one, that the consumer can have choices that are, that are okay, like the good choices to make, rather than, you know, an ebony um, fingerboard, for example. I never knew this until the trip to Peru, but ebony is just a part of the tree that's ripped out of the tree, and the rest is just laid there. So you cut down this tree, just take the little bit of the black wood that you like, it looks pretty, but actually ebony isn't just black. It's a mix of colors, and, and so... Um, as consumers, we are sort of led down these roads of like elegant, exotic woods and oh, they make your sound better and, or, or it's just, it's like a level of success to own like a really nice Babinga wood Warwick or something. But when you get down to it, first off, it's not always necessarily the best sound for the instrument. And second, it really is like blood wood, I think is a great word for it. Blood diamonds. I mean, it's. You, there's blood, sweat, and tears in that wood. And um, so if you're okay with that and you don't mind, like, you know, destroying communities and being an evil person, then just go on and keep <laughs> buying China wood or whatever you want. And, you know, but down the, but if you have a little bit of, um, a little bit of, I think, humanity in your heart, the one thing that you want to do is make sure that you're not um, actually helping illegal activities like um, illegal logging, illegal gold mining illegal sex trafficking, it all kind of starts to get into the same world. And um, this is a question for uh, Diana. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about your background um, in this struggle and how you got in touch with these rock stars who showed up to uh, your community. It must have been a interesting experience. Te quería preguntar un poco, si, si nos puedes contar un poco más sobre tu historia en esta lucha y cómo conociste a estas estrellas que, de rock que llegaron a tu comunidad en Perú. Eh, en primer lugar, de verdad, yo los agradezco a cada uno, a cada uno de los músicos que de verdad tomaron en conciencia de nuestras luchas como pueblos indígenas, ¿sí? y como, como defensora sí. <laughs> sí, gracias eh, que, um, sorry that she is very thankful for I mean, to this group of musicians to take the time in their lives to come and learn about these problems and to join, to join this fight y la oportunidad le conocí como dice a través de esta, de esta fundación de la señorita Julia y a través de la Fundación Rainforest me dijeron, Dianita, tienes una invitación a través con los músicos para difundir, contar tu historia, lo que está pasando en tu pueblo y en tu comunidad. So that um, it was that 
Señorita Julia, that, that's actually me. That's <laughs> and it's not just me. It is. So she she met. She got in touch with the musicians through through EIA, to, through the Environmental Investigation Agency. The work that we do in Peru, uh, which is about uh, trying to stop or to fight illegal logging, illegal timber trade, and especially illegal exports. Um, and that uh, and through Rainforest um, U.S. because we are. Um, we are allies with other NGOs in the country that are trying to do the same fight, and they were working. She knew the people from Rainforest, and um, and we knew them, and we started talking about this possibility of getting together to so that she could tell her story to this group of, of musicians, so that they can tell it to other people in the world. Y entonces me fui emocionada, contenta a conocer, ¿sí? cambiar la experiencia de sí y cómo podemos afrontar lo que estamos viviendo y lo que sabemos que, que el bosque es muy importante para nosotros y para el mundo, ¿sí? Y cuál es la importancia, cómo podemos afrontar de lo que luchamos nosotros. Como dice, ya no es que yo estoy luchando, pero cómo podemos ellos que le compromete a su, a su país o a su pueblo cómo puede difundir. Entonces, para mí ha sido, de verdad, yo me emocioné y cuando viajé con ellos, cuando cantaron, me puso un poco muy sentimental y me puse a llorar cuando las canciones canté. Es que, como dice, vengo de tan lejos, pero aquí nos encontramos para decir, para conocer y para hablar al mundo. So that she was very excited about having this opportunity and started thinking about how, what to tell them, how to tell them, what, how can we join uh, in this fight? So um, that she was very emotional when she had the opportunity to talk to them, to explain them, um, so that they could actually talk to their people, to their government, to their communities, and alert them about these issues. And then to have the opportunity to start singing together, to start sharing these very emotional things. We all get like, you know, we remember about the day, I think I see, I see uh, my friends here. Um, it was, it was, it was very, a very strong, a very strong connection for, for everybody. This opportunity to share what the forest mean and, and the impact that it has. Yeah. And and I think she said something that was very powerful. She said, "We're we're from very far away, but oh, yeah. we've all found ourselves here, right?" Yeah. 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 That's um that's actually part of the song that they sang together. That's that's part of the meaning in in Ashenika. It says, "I come from so far away, and now we are we're here. We're here. We're here together." Right. The the song, la canción. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No yo ta kiro nyanzi, no yo ta kiro no nampiki, no poki na kapani rueni, no poki no nampiki, no yo ta kiro nyanzi, no yo ta kiro nyanzi. Iro pero tsinani, ire pero no nampiki. No yo ta kiro nyanzi, no yo ta kiro apaniro iniki. No poki no nampiki, no poki no nampiki. Sawetoki, Maoni, no yo taquiro, no poca aquí mi janta aquí. Pasonki. Gracias. Vengo, yo como mujer, como mujer luchadora, esa música que canté es dedicado por mi pueblo, por lo que murieron, que no están acá, pero yo estoy para decir para hablar de lo que ellos ya no pudieron decir. Y a los músicos que estamos aquí, yo agradezco a ellos. Esa canción le he dedicado en honor de mi padre, en honor de mi comunidad y en honor de ellos, porque la relación que tenemos va a ser muy complejo, transmitido de corazón, de sentimiento y por defender nuestro bosque.
eso nos une y eso es lo más importante. Um, this is a song about me as a female warrior. Um, I'm fighting for this, for, for, for our rights as a woman. And, uh, and this is a song about, as, as an homage to the people who died from my community, um, the people who are not here, but now I can talk for them. And, uh, and, and also as a thank you to the musicians that came to work together with us and to find a way to make this, to fight to protect the forest. And this is a very strong relationship that we have ongoing now and that is going to, to, to last for long. And, um, you know, for, for our musicians here, I wanted to ask you that experience of going down there. Um, you come from, um, you know, this American musical tradition, but you're coming down to a musical tradition which is so very different um, and ingrained, right? Like in the culture, you know, I come from a, I come from a native community or our tribe is Piscataway, right? And there's not like a big difference between like, oh, here's the singers over here and then here's the rest of society. It's like song is how we tell our stories and there's things we sing together, right? So I guess, you know, as, you know, what was it like going down there and exchanging music and, you know, using that universal language um, with the community down there? Um, you know, that was an amazing experience. And uh, I think as, as soon as we got there, you know, the guitars were brought out and we started playing. And I think KT, who unfortunately is not with us today, uh, she started playing a song. And it was one, one of the most amazing experiences that I've had with music in my life. Uh, she started playing, you know, one, one of her songs, uh, you know, this this Western pop song. And and people started crying right away. Like the the message of the song, the the, the emotion of the music transcended all of those cultural barriers right away and and um you know diana started singing with us right away like there was no you know like here we might be a little more shy you know it's like oh no don't make me sing you know and, <laughs> <laughs> and she was just right right up there right away and we instantly started uh started playing together singing together it was it was an incredibly powerful experience and, and you're reminded just how universal music is yeah, I mean, we it was such a special uh, moment for for me and I think for everybody when that happened when we all started we took out our instruments and we kind of we made a little journey together to this community and then um, we just had found us having some downtime and musicians with downtime are terrible so we just need to <laughs> get our hands on something and so uh, you know we grabbed whatever we could and um, music is a language on, unto itself so even though lyrically we might not have understood what we were saying to each other, but music transcends that and the emotions come through, like James was saying. So, yeah, it was one of those top 10 musical moments of my life as well. It was I mean, I, we're talking a lot about emotions, which I think are really important because that's what this is all about. This is about, you know, starting, starting with us, understanding from Diana, who stole our hearts when we were down there. We all immediately felt her. There were a number of indigenous leaders that uh, were there, uh, but Diana's passion and strength um, and sincerity really grabbed us um, in particular. And, you know, it's one thing to intellectually understand the situation. You know, the first time when I sent out that alert email to everybody going, oh my gosh, we need to do something. And it's a completely other thing to actually be there and see what's happening. We actually saw illegal timber being floated down the river. We visited communities and heard directly from these indigenous leaders whose family members were murdered by illegal loggers and then spoke to the, you know, actually met with government officials that weren't doing anything about this. Um, so that was a really powerful experience for I think all of us um, emotionally um, and, that, and that hasn't left us and it's so easy to tap back into that. and. I think that's what our job is now as musicians because it's part of our job anyway is to open people's hearts uh, with music. And when they're open, we now have this opportunity to do something powerful and actually help. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of, uh, I think we all kind of left Peru uh, with a pretty strong resolve, like, okay, what can we do? How do we help? How do we make sure that the relationships that we have with our fans, that emotional connection can translate? What we're feeling emotionally, we need to be able to to transfer to our fans so they're they're 
motivated to, t to help and take action. And that's, that's the kind of the phase we're moving into now. So we're in, we're in a call to action phase, what you're saying, basically, yeah. Um, so speaking of, um, what brings you to DC? What are we doing tonight and what, what are we doing this week? <laughs> so yeah well so while we were down there we we shot a, a documentary um of the trip and and everything that's happening there um and so we're premiering that tonight here at the eaton and uh, we'll be having a panel discussion much like we're having now um and we'll also be performing a few songs but uh yeah so this is the the launch of that and then simultaneously we're launching uh, uh defend the defenders action site so we'll be doing this live on Facebook, on Reverse Facebook page tonight. Uh, I think the Eaton's also streaming that. And then we're going to be leading people, as far as this call to action stage, to the reverb.org backslash defend, where people can learn more about the issue and then directly add their, their voice and their name to a letter that we've written together with, yeah, well, actually, EIA wrote it, and we're supporting it, uh, to the Peruvian president, demanding indigenous rights and the end to illegal logging. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, when we um, opened the registration for the for the event tonight, it was filled immediately. Wow. <laughs> so um, we're very happy about that. But so to just people who would like to be part of this and didn't have the chance to come or are not in DC, please join Reverb's um, Facebook because you will be able to follow everything from there and you will get more information about how to join the action, which is very important from now on. Yeah. And I wanted to ask Diana what her goals are. ¿Qué son sus metas? Um, ¿Qué esperas que pase? ¿Qué es tu, tu visión? Sí. Ahora, como digo, como dice, a ver, es la primera vez que voy a participar acá en Washington y agradezco a, a este país que me cogieron. Como dice, para mí mi meta Ahora que esperamos acá, no solo Yodi, con todos los músicos, y ¿cuál es el mensaje? ¿Y qué es, lo que, qué es lo que va a pensar el público? ¿Y qué queremos hacia el futuro? ¿sí? Porque ya no pensamos por nosotras como, como, como personas, sino ya nosotros pensamos por nuestros hijos, porque ellos van a quedar, porque si uno no se lucha, si uno no luchamos nuestro, nuestro pueblo, nuestra identidad, de dónde venimos, de dónde somos, entonces nuestros hijos ya no van a tener esta conexión con, con el medio ambiente, con el bosque. Um, she, she's very thankful for, um, to the United States for receiving her, for inviting her, giving her the opportunity to be here. Uh, this is her first time in Washington. Um, and... Um, what what to expect from here um to for people to take action for things to to change um because it's not just about about us she says it's not just about me as a woman it's about this is a this is this is a fight for for our forest for our heritage for our culture and this is not just for the ones who are alive this is for our kids and for the future generations uh for what we need to pass um um not just for the community also it's it's really for for the world for the planet e, and something she said was about um the the struggle for the for the future generations to have that connection um y eso para mí es muy fuerte ese concepto porque nos, en nuestra comunidad tenemos una expresión que es no te olvides de tus ancestros porque ellos no se lo olvidaron de ti. So, our, our, an expression in our community is don't forget your ancestors because they didn't forget you, right? And that, essentially that's why you're here, right? Y eso para mí es como verte y a tu lucha es casi como para nosotros hemos estado en esto por 400 años. Han construido un, una ciudad capital en nuestra tierra. Right? For us, like, we've been in this for 400 years, my tribe. They, they built their capital city on our land. And um, verte a ti y tu lucha que estás haciendo ahora es como ver uno de mis ancestros casi. Porque, y no para ponerte en ese como que estás en el pasado, no, estás en tu presente y estás en tu futura, 
pero lo que ustedes están experimentando es algo que creo que nosotros experimentamos hace cientos de años. Y como, and I'm saying, it, me, meeting her is almost like speaking to one of my ancestors because what they're going through now is something that went, we went through hundreds of years ago. You know, that, that front line um, sort of contact and struggle um, for the very basic things of life and con basic connection to land. And, um, no sé, me, me, me inspiras mucho porque um, lo que, lo, la lucha que, que ustedes están armando me da um, fe para nosotros que pensando en tal vez siete generaciones de mi comunidad vamos a llegar al moment, a un momento que que de, po podemos luchar de nuevo para nuestro territorio, nuestras tierras y nuestras tradiciones, porque ahora estamos luchando para cosas muy como intangibles, cosas que como leyes, políticas, cosas. I'm saying like our struggles right now, like in my community, are very intangible and they're very like psychological and like, you know, these higher, more abstract levels of like, you know, we're talking about policy, legislation, changing our minds and stuff. But I'm saying maybe seven generations from now we'll be able to fight for our land again the way they are. And, um, pe pero eso es gracia y mi, y yo teniendo mi identidad, mi cultura, mis cantos, todo eso, es gracias a ti. I'm saying the reason I have all my culture and my language and stuff is because of her. Because, porque fue un ancestro, fue un, fue un mujer, porque de, de la mujer se transmite la cultura. It, it was a woman because a w through the woman it's the, cu the culture's past that I'm alive now. Que, que, es, que estoy vivo ahora. Es porque hay una, hay, había un, una mujer o una abuela que se levantó cada día en la madrugada y decidió ser indígena. There was a woman that woke up every day and decided that day to be indigenous. Y es gracias a eso que estoy aquí. Entonces, me inspiras mucho. Eh, en primer lugar, como yo siempre digo, la meta para nosotros como mujer, como de una cultura de, yo siempre dije, si yo no lucho por mi pueblo, ¿qué será más adelante su futuro de mis hijos? Ya no van a tener la conexión de lo que yo tengo, de lo que me dieron mis abuelos, mis antes pasados, mis bisabuelos, que yo todavía le vi y que mis hijos también sigan. En el, en, el mismo, en el mismo conectado. Porque qué pasa si nosotros como pueblo, como, como una cultura, y que el gobierno te saca de la nada, ¿y dónde se va esa persona a migrar a la ciudad? Pues nosotros no somos de una ciudad, somos de los bosques, comemos de ellos. Y como siempre dijo Tramití, el bosque para mí es mi vida, mi motor de mi corazón, como dice el pulmón, porque sin esa no podemos vivir. Porque el bosque es persona, es, su, es ser humano. Es que a veces las personas fuera que vive conectadamente con la ciudad no conoce más allá, no escucha, porque no tiene esa conexión directamente. That's long. <laughs> <laughs> let me try to let me try to pick it up so um it is for her um maybe i would talk like in first person for me to 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 wake up to 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 live the, the reason of my life is to protect to make sure that i can pass this culture to my children to make sure that the forest survive without the forest we would not have our culture what would be the future of my children and their children they would not I mean, I was lucky enough to receive all this heritage from my parents and my grandparents, and I want that to keep happening for the future generations. Um, if, if the government comes and rips us around from our territory, what are we? We're nothing. We would have to move to the cities, and we're not people from the city. We cannot relate to them. We, we are connected to the forest. And because the forest is everything. The forest is, um, is, a, is, is a human being. The forest has life in itself. 
and we live from the forest, we feed from the forest, uh, we, we have this connection that sometimes ple people from the city cannot understand, but that's what we're trying to explain. Um, and that's, that's, our, that's our, our message and that's what we need to pass on. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, the campaign, it's called Defend the Defenders because uh, we also took a trip a couple of years ago to Guatemala where we saw uh, yeah, some more positive stories where uh, indigenous people had been given stewardship over the land. And because of that connection that you just heard about, uh, those are the best stewards of the forest uh, because they're not just thinking about themselves. They're thinking about future generations. So we need to put that land back in the hands of those people because this benefits the entire planet. Those are the lungs of our planet. Right. So it's not just about their communities. They absolutely, uh, you know, have their right. But that this this affects all of us in the entire, you know, the entire globe. So we need to have more of a global perspective on that. Yeah, that's. That, <laughs> go ahead, Stefan. Uh, I absolutely agree, and I think that it's it happens in the Amazon. It happens all over the world. And so if we can start here um, and help out these particular communities, maybe that can spread to other parts of the, the world. And, um, <clears throat> you know, looking, I thought a lot about American history, actually, when I was in Peru. And um, it saddened me, actually, that we had, didn't take more steps in America like they're taking in Peru right now to fight against this sort of government oversight and government giving land titles to businesses and corporations over the people who live there, who deserve to be there. So, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot of um, similarities and parallels to what's happening there. It's just kind of just starting there, where in other places in the world, um, that fight was lost, or at least in context of today, it seems lost. Hi, and now I want to talk a little bit from with my own voice. <laughs> uh, as as a Peruvian um, working, I mean, for for the protection of the forest, but the, for, for the protection of the defenders of the forest too, of course, to support their fight. Um, it's very important for us that um, that Diana and the other indigenous leaders in the documentary that you're going to see had the chance to amplify their voices through these musicians that actually can reach many more people around the world. Uh, but it's also important for us to, to do this in Peru. Like another musician that was joining us that you're going to see in the documentary, Nico Saba. He's a Peruvian, but he, he grew up in Lima, in the capital, in the coast. And uh, he had visited the jungle before, but he had never really got connected to the jungle. So for him, this trip was also very important, was eyes opening. And uh, you will see his testimony, but the thing is that he was surprised and also kind of embarrassed as a Peruvian not to understand what's the impact of the forest destruction on our own people, right? right? And that's, that's what we really need. We need, I think that, as, as Stefan was saying before, if you're evil and you're okay with that, go ahead. I don't think that anybody I mean, <laughs> is really there, right? I mean, I think that people don't act or don't, don't take action, don't change, because they don't understand what's happening. You don't understand what's the impact of your um, consumer decisions in real people's lives, right? From, from now and from future generations. And I think that once we get and we understand that, we cannot stay put doing nothing. We all need to, <laughs> we, we will feel, and I'm sure everybody, you guys that are listening, I'm sure you're going to feel compelled to take action and we're counting on that. Yeah, I mean, so like back to the blood, blood wood and blood diamonds, you know, I think in this country, there's decent consumer awareness when it comes to coffee and where it comes from or our right. clothes yeah. or our food. Yeah. So like there's certain parts of our consumer Choices that we're, that there's some awareness of in this country, you know, we're like, oh wait a minute, where are those beans being, you know, picked from, and, and how are the, how are the workers being treated, or clothing, and but not yet with wood, and not yet with every. Honestly, it applies to absolutely everything, um, and I think we're getting there culturally, but not fast enough, clearly, um, and and I think that's a big part of what we can do 
um, as far as telling that story, letting people understand that there really are very real examples of how what you buy can affect real people on the ground all around the world. Um, either positively in the case of right. Guatemala, where it was actually supporting indigenous communities, or negatively in the case that we're, we're seeing in Peru. Right. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and that's always sort of a conversation, you know, that we have, right, is consumption um, is driven by these larger systems, right? So like maybe if I decide to get a straw or not today, it's not going to make a big difference. But um, if we look at the system that upholds those unsustainable consumption or, or straight up evil consumption practices, you know, how do we challenge that while still like doing our best to not be personally complicit? But then like, I guess it's like shopping at Whole Foods doesn't make you a good person, right? Or like buying fair trade coffee doesn't make you a good person. But like we want to live in a world where it's not where the system is set up so that it doesn't, <laughs> you know, we don't have to be those, you know, those people, those like good, you know, the quote unquote yeah. good conscious people. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I read something recently that being an environmental activist in Latin America is like one of the most dangerous occupations in the world right now, the highest mortality rate, you know? So, um, and I know we got to, we're running, how are we on time? We're kind of running out of time. I don't want to let you guys go. But my last question is, um, when you talk about defend the defenders and the defenders, the threat, the, the, the personal bodily threat is so real, right? What does that look like? Like, I mean, I see, you know, you're, you're giving Diana and these communities a lot of vi public, like, visibility. Is that part of the strategy for protecting folks is by sort of putting them out there more and, you know, make, hoping that the public eye shelters people a little bit? Like, how's that? What's the defend the defender's strategy? Well, from the, from the Rewa perspective, then, uh, Julia can speak from the EIA perspective. Um, for us, it's, it's definitely, you know, so the latest call to action that we're launching today is uh, a letter writing campaign to the Peruvian president um, and basically letting him know that our eyes are on on this and that the, the world is watching um, and a applying pressure there. Um, and then, you know, we've took meetings. We were lucky at EIA set up some nice meetings directly in Lima when, with government officials. Um, and some, I think there were some results that came immediately out of that. With, with, you know, with it, it, some levels, like what you're talking about, some of this is very basic stuff. Like, can we get justice for the, for the people who, who murdered uh, these leaders, you know, Diana's father? Um, and to not even be able to, you know, have a meeting from the from the government to even talk about it or to try to move the trial to, to a place that would make more sense. Um, even just our little, our time there, we were able to at least move that ball down the court a little further. So on, the real answer is we're going to do everything we possibly can. <laughs> um, but those are the immediate things that we're doing uh, from the Reaver perspective and, and with, with EIA's help for sure and, and guidance and direction. You know, I feel like Reaver's role in this is really to just bring the musicians and the fan bases that, we you know can speak to to this issue and we're really following eia's lead on this who are the true experts on the ground as to what is going on and how we can best apply pressure and and action yes and um and to build alliances as you see as, as you say with with other organizations with other um, civil society structures in the field and with the directly with the, with the indigenous leaders, with indigenous organizations, with indigenous communities that are being affected. Um, as you say, yes, I mean, being exposed um, somehow shelters you. I mean, it's also, it depends on how you take it, right? There are other cases where being exposed is a provocation. But it's always easier to attack somebody who is anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I have a background as a journalist investigating corruption also, and that was always... The, 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 way, the way we looked at it, right? I mean, if you assassinate one journalist and then nothing happens, you're opening the door to have more being assassinated because that's a way to kill a story, right? If you actually attack somebody and then the story, instead of disappearing, becomes bigger and stronger, then that changes, right? I mean, that's like a insurance um, against um, against the tax. The same thing um, should work for or could work for um, environmental defenders. In many of the cases, um, Peru is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be an environmental defender. Um, 
and um, and most of the most of the attacks and assassinations are never investigated, and most of them never make it to the media. For many reasons, but most of it because it's a struggle of, of power, and things happen in isolated places. Sometimes the communities don't have the way to communicate these these attacks, or nobody really believes them, or nobody cares. So those are the things that we're trying to change. We're trying to tell these stories to show that this is this is happening, and this is. Um, it's not okay for the government or for the authorities to just let it go, right? And uh, as, as, as you know, we, did, we didn't talk about that in this conversation, but um, four indigenous leaders from Diana's community were assassinated in 2014, and um, nobody has been charged uh, for those crimes yet. Um, the investigation has been very, very weak, um, there are new things happening these days as, as we speak, uh, but f more than four years have gone by and they haven't found justice. And this is a case that had very high international uh, media cover. So for other cases, other cases just disappear and Diana had the opportunity to meet the other indigenous leaders from Peru, other indigenous leaders from other areas that are also under threat, right? So it's not just the story of Saweto. It's the story of indigenous communities in Peru. It's the story of indigenous communities in the world who are fighting for their rights and are fighting against pretty powerful international corporations, right? Strong economic interests. So we need to do everything we can, as, uh, as um, we're talking about, to, as Adam said, to, um, to um, balance that, to counterbalance that, right? And to and to, and to win that, um, that the attention of the media, the attention, guys, the attention of all of you who are listening to us today, please tell this story to your friends, invite them to listen, invite them to, to get interested. That's what we need. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Okay, well, I'm gonna let these, uh, these folks go. Um, they have a, a busy day and um, a lot to do here in DC. These are men and women on a mission, so uh, I'll let them get back to it. But thank you so much for joining us. Muchísimas gracias, Diana, por estar aquí nos, con nosotros y espero que podamos pasar un poco más tiempo uh, mientras estás aquí. Gracias a todos. Thank you, everybody, for stopping by. Thank you. Thank you.